Uh, we're here with Eric Reese, author of The Lean Startup uh, at NYU in the uh, entrepreneurial journalism class. And uh, Eric, can you give us a brief bio of who you are? I guess you should know that I started out writing code for a living. So I was like the nerd in the basement programming computers as a kid. And I was like all set to do that you know, my whole life. But in the dot-com bubble, I got bit with the entrepreneurial bug. And so built some companies that failed and then got sick and tired of companies failing doing it the traditional way and so eventually started building companies in a different way starting with a company called InView which is a 3D avatar social network and then uh, that became successful and I started writing about some of my experiences from that uh, and calling it this thing called Lean Startup which then has subsequently taken over my life and now whatever this is I do it for a living so that's the, <laughs> that uh, uh, is, is how I wound up here. Uh, and what is this now? But. Um... It is like a, you're like a mini empire right now. <laughs> Everywhere I go online, there's Eric. He's doing a video here. He's mentioned here. Uh, I did a Q&A with him last call, I think. Or, uh, yeah, it's partly your fault. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, actually, he, uh, I talked to Eric, I guess, uh, I guess when you started writing your book. Uh -huh. And I tried to, to warn him about the pitfalls of dealing with book publishers. That's super helpful. Uh, uh, I guess it was. I don't know. Look how, look how well things turned out. I was very cynical. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Never be too cynical when it comes to that kind of thing. <laughs> At any rate, uh, what, why would anyone want to be an entrepreneur? I know, right? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a really good question. It, it totally sucks. Um, it's well, it's like worst. I think I think like if you bat a hundred in the major leagues, you would have a higher uh, you know chance of success than starting a business. Yeah, you get paid more, and you know you'd be famous, and people would treat you better. I like, guess yeah, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship is really excruciatingly difficult, and um, part of the problem with entrepreneurship being cool right now. I don't know if you guys have noticed, it's cool, and everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, and you know people making movies about entrepreneurs is like just promulgating this really inaccurate view of entrepreneurship that it is fun and easy and exciting, and it is anything but. It is a grind. It is really difficult. And it's really embarrassing at, more often than it is validating. But uh, the flip side is if you want to change the world and create something of lasting value and, um, I don't know how to say this, and really see your vision you know, publicly realized in a way that you, know, you can be proud of whether you win or lose, then entrepreneurship is a uniquely awesome career choice. And it is a career choice now. I think that is really different than you know, what entrepreneurship looked like in the 20th century. It, it is now something that you can do for your whole career. You can do it inside and outside established companies. You can you know, develop a skill set, a talent for entrepreneurship that can serve you well uh, you know, through your entire career. And so I think that's actually it's exciting. It's cool to see it become a little bit professionalized, but not any more, not any more easy. <laughs> not any less embarrassing. We write about the success stories, we, and they're really the outliers. They're the Twitters and the Facebooks and, and so on and so forth, the ones that really make it, the ones that, you know, in one case, might have a $100 billion valuation. But we don't really often write about the failures unless they are spectacular failures. Then they're really fun to write about. Yeah. Um, the, the real stories, are not, they're not very good stories. And that's the problem, right? A guy who like spent five years in his garage tinkering on something that you know, then it turned out that nobody wanted to buy. And so he just like kept tinkering on it forever, draining his family's savings <laughs> and accomplished nothing. Like, that's not a good story. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, or an end. It's like, it's all end, the whole story. It's like just a decline into oblivion. And that's what most entrepreneurial ventures actually look like. So I understand why you don't want to tell those stories, but the resulting selection bias means that we, as entrepreneurs, take in this media message about, you know, the plane is losing, uh, losing altitude, and uh, uh, we're going to crash in the ground. And oh my God, we got to really like fight to you know get that first customer and pull back on the oak really hard and like just barely achieve liftoff before we hit the ground. And in the movies, like every time you ever have that set up, like you achieve liftoff. Right? You never ever in a movie see someone like struggling with the controls of a plane and then boom, just craters it right into the ground. That's not a very good story. It's depressing to watch him futilely struggle with the controls, but that's actually what most startups look like. It's controlled flight into ground. And so, yeah, yeah, please stop doing that. Um, so uh, for any of you uh, looking for a, a career in this, uh, be forewarned. <laughs> um, so uh, there are a lot of mistakes that people make, um, you know, that I've made, that I, it almost seems like uh, everyone who makes the same mistake 
seems to make similar mistakes. Yeah. And it's almost like taking that old, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, line from Anna Karenina where like all happy families are happy in the same way, but uh, all miserable families are miserable in different ways. And in this case, it's like everyone seems to make the same mistakes. So it's a little yeah. bit different. Uh -huh. For example, the first thing someone does is I have an idea, I'm going to raise some venture capital. They seem to skip about 12 steps, <laughs> for example. What are some of the other mistakes that people make before they kick off? Well, to me, all these mistakes are just um, people believing their own story. So if you've never had this experience, it's really hard to explain. But when you have a great idea, and it's the greatest idea you've ever had, and it's going to change the world, you can see it clearly, then everything that happens makes you think the idea is even greater. Anyone actually had this experience yet? Yeah. OK, so it doesn't matter what. Like, if someone tells you the idea is dumb, that makes you think the idea is better. Because like that obviously is great that that person doesn't understand because we don't want people like that to understand it's perfect, right? You know, you you read a market research report about some trend, you're like, my thing's an example of that trend. Every trend is like, I am surfing the wave, I am in the right place at the right time, and it's a it's just a human phenomenon that the more we know about our own idea, the more confident and excited we get about it. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of good now psychology research about the fewer data points you actually have, the more confident you are in the story that you're telling. So actually what your mind is doing to help you develop that confidence is screening out all conflicting data points so that you can't even remember having them. It's a very useful trait, apparently, evolutionarily. It's really not good in business. Because what happens is you then make plans based on your confidence that you know what's going to happen. And normally, if I came in here and I was like, guess what, I'm someone who can reliably predict the future, you'd be like, oh, crazy person, right. Yeah, like anyone who says that is, you know, like has a mental disease. We, we, we understand that that is absolutely impossible. But somehow when we get into business, then like that's totally cool. You're like, look, we're going to launch this thing on this date, and then we're going to need this huge sales staff and like a big customer support staff to handle it. So obviously we've got to raise a lot of money now to be ready for the thing when it happens. And that, you know, I think all of the really like clumsy mistakes people make, spending way too much money, like going far too long before getting real feedback and validation, all, they all come back to you know, what they call in psychology the planning fallacy. Like, we believe we can make plans in an uncertain future because we can predict the future. And that's just it's an empirical question. It's just not true. So talk a bit about your own experiences with the, the startups you did before IMVIEW or IMVIEW. I like IMVIEW, but we never correct anybody. I would say I just spell it out IMVIEW. <laughs> yeah, that's fine too. Okay. Uh, it's, it's one of those unpronounceable words. So the first startup I did, um, was what I call the first half of the social network experience. So you've seen the movie The Social Network? Everything happened in the first half of the movie. I had that experience. We did, we had just as good an idea, got all our friends, all the smartest people in school like together, built this thing, we were in the right place at the right time, everything was awesome. We worked super hard, we went through that photo montage where they're like pounding on keyboards and chugging some beer and writing on the whiteboards, like that, that special fancy whiteboard pen you need to write on the windows, like we did that too. And we did everything. And then uh, the part where they actually make a lot of money and then sue each other, we didn't, we didn't do the making a lot of money part. But every other part we did. So it looked, it looked a lot like the movie, uh, except for the being successful part. And we were onto something. I mean, this was the year 2000. We, we wanted to create online profiles for college students from top schools for the purpose of sharing. Does that sound pretty good? That did actually turn out to be a pretty good idea. But we thought, because we wanted to make what we thought of as a real business, we were like, who should they share them with? They should share them with employers to help them get a job. So that actually is not as good an idea, as it turns out. And if someone had gone back, if you could go back in time and, and put us on the couch and be like, guys, forget employers. Like, that doesn't matter. Like, this is Facebook. And, you know, we would have been like, come on, be serious. We, we don't want to build some stupid, you know, poking other people thing. We want to build a real business. We didn't understand what a real business was. We just figured it had something to do with making money. So we're like, here's a thing. We sell it to companies. It's perfect. And uh, when the dot-com bubble crashed, we crashed too. So we had spent a ton of money building up this resume database of all these students. Uh, we had this really beautiful business plan good 40 pages. I mean, we were students, so we, like, we understood that business plan was basically like a senior thesis. So, you know, it was well-researched, extremely well-written. Uh, we had this very complicated model in the back, spreadsheet model based on census data and market research reports, and like we spent a lot of time in the library building up this thing. And it told us that uh, every customer in our database was going to be worth a certain amount of money. I don't remember the numbers anymore, but like $25 on average per person we get in the database. And therefore, we were like, great, well, if we spend $10 to acquire a customer and get them in the database, we've just made $15 of profit. 
So we had a target, you know, to spend ten dollars. Of course, so we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars acquiring customers, and then it turned out that actually the resume database was worth zero dollars per person, uh, and so we couldn't make any money from it. And so we basically burned through all the money we raised as quickly as we could raise it. And then as soon as the dot com bubble burst, the kind of people who were dumb enough to invest in us, well, that can tell you something about their investment acumen. And they all they all went away in the dot com bubble. All of a sudden, they all everybody crashed, and the thing totally died. So it was really a horrible experience because if you think back to the movies, you know that scene where uh, you know the plucky protagonist is like persevering in the face of scorn and criticism from the skeptics who are like, "That'll never work. You should never do that." Well, if you go out on your own and do something that is not the usual path, you will hear that all from a lot of people. They are not human beings are very unkind when someone else is going outside the conventional route. Um, and in the movies, the most satisfying part of the movie for a lot of us is the moment where all those people are proven wrong. You know, and you go back, you're like, ha, I told you so. Well, in real life, those people are right most of the time. So I just want you to visualize the experience of going back to them and being like, remember when you said this thing would never work and I was really stupid for doing it? Yeah, like, yeah, you were right. It didn't work out. But that, that really sucks. So that was, that was, uh, that was the kind of uh, startup experience I had before, you know, trying to change the way that we build companies. And the problem is that that method I mean, I've tried to tell it to you in as ridiculous a form as possible so that you'd be like, I would never make that mistake. But actually, what I just described is to most people is simply the intuitive way you build something new. It, it just seems right and logical. And so people gravitate to it even though it has a horrible, horrible failure rate. I'm so depressed right this now. This is kind of a grim <laughs> opening here. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the successful company. Um, you did and things differently. Well, you started out doing things kind of the same way, though, right? With the, with the uh, IMDU? Yeah, well, we, we, did, we did some things right and we did some things wrong. And in fact, I can tell the story two ways. I can tell the story that like, we were geniuses and we basically got everything right from the beginning. And I can tell the story that like, we were idiots and we got everything wrong from the beginning. And the truth is, actually, both stories are completely true. We got some things absolutely right and some things absolutely wrong. And the things we got right turned out to be more important than the things we got wrong. The well, how did that, uh, you know, who, who had the original initial idea uh, for the business? And how did you get involved with it? Yeah, so there were five of us who founded the company together. And we had actually worked together on a previous project uh, that was technologically similar. It had to do with 3D avatars. And it was a gigantic failure also. So I got a lot of failure. You, you follow my path. You can be a big failure too. It's very exciting. Uh, and so we had experience working together. And we had just done this, these previous companies where people told us we were geniuses. I mean, we were getting all kinds of positive feedback right up until the day the company just was destroyed. I mean, everyone was just like, everything we were doing was right from the conventional model of how things are done in Silicon Valley. So one thing we did was we were like, let's just try to make some new mistakes. Okay, that's that's going to be our explicit goal, is to just try to do it differently and see what happens. And so when we, when we started to build InView, we were very focused on getting a product into the market much faster which for us was, we gave ourselves a six month deadline instead of the previous company had taken five years. So we're like six months, that's really fast. And so we worked really, really hard to build that product. And I, you know, I was a CTO, so I'm the like, main technical co-founder in charge of engineering. And I was really into agile software development, which is like the latest, greatest uh, thinking in how you build software. And so we were really trying to build things very efficiently, drive all the waste out of our process, be really rigorous about uh, testing everything. And then we finally put the product out there after six months. And you gotta understand, this is a very complicated product. I mean, if you guys probably don't know InView, but it is 3D avatar, instant messaging, social networking, you know, micro payments, virtual goods, you know, make your own clothing and sell it to other customers. Like it's a very complicated product. And so in six months we could not build a very good version. In fact, it kinda sucked after six months, if I'm being really honest. And I was really embarrassed. You know, like people I had plenty of mentors who were like, You can't ship this. It is so horrible that your reputation is going to be ruined. And I often say, I think I said this in the book, you know, we had this nightmare about some journalist, you know, enterprising journalists, of which there are so many in the world, uh, doing deep research to discover something new. And they would see our new product, and they would check it out, and they would be like, this is terrible. And like, that would be like headline news. Idiots at IMVU don't know what quality means. You know, never hire them again. And like, there's my mugshot looking sad in the picture. I mean. It's funny only because like there's no investigative journalism left. But if there was, maybe this kind of thing would happen. I was about to chime in. But. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, listen. I wish that kind of thing happened, but the reality is it didn't. So we we shipped this product and we put it out there and we told people to use it, and then not a single person would even download it. And so no one actually found out how bad it was. So actually, it was kind of a relief. It was like, well, if you had dodged a bullet, my reputation is safe. 
but like, wait a minute, why did we just spend six months, you know, all lean and agile and driving out waste when the product that we built is so bad, no one even wants to try it. No one could even find out how bad our design decisions were. So that was pretty embarrassing. And to make a long story short, and you obviously can read the book if you want all the details, we wound up having to pivot the business away from the first strategy that we kind of put together, first business plan, to something different. And we wound up basically throwing away almost all the software that I personally had written during that time. So that was really depressing. Because it was like, why did I have to be here killing myself, working 20 hour days, cranking the software out, if we were just going to throw it away? Couldn't I have been on the beach you know, having vacation? My co-founders, you know, since my work got thrown out anyway, couldn't they have just done the work they did with the same value? And, you know, the way you make yourself feel better in these kind of situations, I'll give you a quick tip if you ever find yourself with this, one of these big abject failures and you're trying to justify it to yourself, you can always say, well, it was a good learning experience. And that's exactly what I said. When the first, when that company we built, you know, first half of the social network, I, I remember telling myself all the time, well, it was, at least we learned a lot of really important lessons about business. And I used the same trick here. And I felt better for a while until I had this thought. If the point of this exercise was to learn this critical thing about customers, namely they didn't want this product, why did it take six months? And why did we write all this software? How come the word learning is only coming up now at the end as an excuse? How come we never talked about learning the whole time we were building the product? We just talked about, you know, the same stuff they talk about in the social network, like what features does it absolutely have to have? What's the business model? What kind of car are we going to drive when we get famous? <laughs> That's what we spent our time on. <laughs> and so, you know, I believe now that um, because of the uncertainty we face as entrepreneurs, learning is our most vital uh, unit of progress, if you will. And so it's just hard to not just make up a story about what we learned. So we call it validated learning, scientific learning that's like backed up by real data that says, no, we actually are figuring out what works and what doesn't. I, if we had done that, if we used that framework to make our plans in those first six months, we could have launched that product after six hours, not six months. Because since nobody clicked even the download button, it didn't matter if there was a product available or not, because no one even tried it. So we could have just, you know, I invited people to download and then apologized to the zero percent of people who would have clicked that there's no product yet. That would have been exactly the same in terms of the value to us as a company, and that was pretty unsettling, you know, as an engineer. So uh, you did. So you ended up taking, creating some focus groups and bringing people in and trying to figure out why they weren't downloading it. Why weren't they downloading it? Well, once, like the problem with this is, remember I said that when you have a great idea, everything makes you convinced that you're right? So before we launched this product, we did plenty of focus groups and talked to lots of customers, and they loved it. At least that's how I remember it. Everything we told them, they're like, best idea ever, you're gonna make so much money. Just every, every conversation with customers made us convinced that we were gonna make a lot of money. But once we shipped the product and nobody downloaded it, then we had a mystery on our hands. And human beings do better, a lot better. You, this is journal I'm going to explain to you. Like, you have a mystery on your hands. Like, that is where the motivation to really find out what's actually happening comes from. And now we had, like, a mystery. Mystery is, I think this product is the best thing ever, and so do customers. And yet, empirically speaking, no one will download it. What's going on? So then our uh, in-person interviews with customers got a lot more interesting. And we would bring, you know, like this product primarily used by teenagers, so you bring a teenager into our office and we put them down and we'd be like, hey, there's this instant messaging add-on that interoperates with all the existing IM clients and brings you this 3D avatar technology, and they'd be like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? And we're like, well, it's this add-on that interoperates, and they're like, I understand, is it an instant messaging client or not? And we're like, well, kind of. It's, it's an add-on. And they're like, I never heard of that. My friends have never heard of that. Like, I'm not, do like, I'm not doing it. And we'd be like, what do you mean you're not doing it? You're, you're, we're paying you to be here in this room, do this usability test. Like, you're going to download the software. That's, and they're like, OK, fine. So we could make them download the product. And they would like get to the part where they would customize their avatar. And they liked that part a lot. They'd be like, oh, this is really cool. They'd pick out what clothes they wanted to wear, like really style the avatar in their room and the whole, you know, all that virtual reality stuff. They love that. And then we'd be like, OK, now it's time for you to uh, invite one of your friends to chat with. And they'd be like, not going to do that. And we try the same trick again. We're like, no, nah, um, we're paying you to be here, so you're going to do it. And I remember clear as day, they're just like, no, you have to keep your money. I'm not doing it. And we're like, why not? They're like, I don't know if this thing is cool yet. And you want me to invite one of my friends to something? I don't know if it's cool. What if it turns out to be lame? That makes me lame. All right? Think about what does it mean for something to be mission critical? Like for a teenager, okay, like do not make me look stupid in front of my friends is like pretty high up on the list of like most important things a product can do. And it was just a deal breaker. They were not going to, like our whole business plan, 
The whole reason we done instant messaging interoperability was because we just had this bedrock belief that people would want to use this product with their friends. So if they won't do the key behavior of inviting their friends to use it, then we have no business. I mean, that's what we call a leap of faith assumption. If you make that number in the spreadsheet zero, all the other numbers go to zero because it's a, it's a prerequisite for us having any kind of success. And I can't tell you how many conversations we had with customers before that moment where we had just ignored this problem. You know, it just didn't register. And the problem with me telling you the story is, I know what you're thinking. She's like, you guys, you guys are really dumb. I would never make that mistake, because it's so obvious what you're saying. I'm like, and it's impossible for me to communicate to you how when it's your idea, the, the things that seem obvious to you now like, will not seem obvious, and you will be in the cloud of love, just you know, in love with your own idea. And so all these techniques in the startup are all specifically about, I know that you're right, I'm sure that you're right. Your idea is, in fact, the best thing ever. But let's just double check. And let's just double check using a scientific methodology that won't allow us to kind of drink the Kool-Aid and BS ourselves into thinking that it's great when actually there's a problem. So we're just going to like check out, make sure the engine is, in fact, you know, suitable for flying in before we get in the plane, or pick your favorite metaphor. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? And then what happened? So you, you basically had to make some changes. How were you able to? What changed, and how did you uh, execute this pivot? The biggest, I mean, the pivot itself, once we came to the moment of realization that we were failing, which I wish, I make it sound like you know, over, we made a realization overnight, but in reality, it's like months and months of us banging our head against the wall. Once we realized we had to pivot, it, the pivot itself was very easy. I mean, it just became very clear that we had to be a standalone instant messaging network. We couldn't be an add-on. Customers didn't understand that. So we had to create a new network. And we had to make it so that you could use the product with strangers. People wanted to make new friends instead of hanging out with their existing friends. And that sounds like, duh, pretty simple, straightforward thing. But it took us years to understand that. And that really was a very deep and difficult insight about customers and what they wanted. Uh, so once we changed the product, and, and we threw out a lot of code, but we got to keep a lot of other stuff. I and mean, it was still, fundamentally, it was true to our vision. We're just changing the strategy by which we would get customers to sign up. And that's, you know, that's the key to a pivot, a change in strategy without a change in vision. And then like from that point on, things got easier. And that's the nice thing about pivoting, is when you've had a successful pivot, everything gets easier. So you know it's working, because the experiments that you're doing to try and change customer behavior for the better, they just feel like they start working. And the, the problem is that in the inverse situation, when, the, when you haven't pivoted but you should, it feels like you're not working hard enough. So the number one symptom, and I remember this clear as day, because I was, I was in charge of the engineering team. So I was the one building the product. And I was one of my co-founders looking at me like, your team's not getting anything done. And I'm like, sure we are. We, we built all these features. But they're like, well, look at the numbers. Our numbers are not moving at all. So, right? And we felt like we were being unproductive. And I was like the one being like, we got to work harder, work harder, work harder. But the problem isn't that we were, weren't working hard enough. It's that we were really efficiently, excellently building this plan that made no sense. So until we changed plans, you know, we could never have that feeling of productivity. And if any of you have ever worked in a regular job, this is the exact opposite of what happens in real work. You know, most jobs, if you do a good, like if you work hard and do your thing, like things get incrementally better. And the harder you work, the better things get. And so if you've been trained as a designer, or you have friends who are designers, you're like designer makes something easier to use, like the numbers all go up and everything's just a little bit better. Engineer makes it faster, perform better, like everything gets a little bit better. But if you have a product that people don't want, making it easier to use makes it easier for them to realize they don't want it. So they can just churn out faster. So you actually make the situation worse when you make it easier to use. And that is like really counterintuitive for anyone who's had a regular job. And then we become entrepreneurs. Like that intuition is just it's lethal. So this idea of the pivot is key. <clears throat> Almost any company you can think about that's emerged in the last 20 years had a, has had a major pivot. Times Twitter was actually audio podcast business. A uh, Flickr started out as an online multiplayer game. I mean, you can almost any company that you can think of uh, has had to pivot. Uh, sometimes even corporations pivot. We were just talking earlier about IBM is like a, an amazing example of a company that realized that if it kept going where it was going, they weren't going to survive. So they sold their computer business, IBM. And now their, their, their market cap is even bigger now than it was before. I mean, that's, that takes a lot of uh, courage. So this idea of the pivot is, is really key. And it's something that almost every startup faces, that you don't start, you start off with a great idea, but then reality hits. And at some point, you're going to have to make a move. 
And so uh, I have a feeling for all of you who are creating businesses, this is something that you're going to have to do too. It's very rare, I think. Probably, can you put a percentage to it? How often does it happen that somebody has an idea and then it takes off and then that's, that's the story? It's basically uh, act one of a movie. I honestly don't know a single case. The problem is that um, as soon as companies are successful, they pay professionals a lot of money to create a story that makes it seem like they got it right at the beginning. I mean, if you, this is a problem for business journalists. Is there's an industry of people who get paid to erase the story and make it more compatible with, the, with making the founders look like they're geniuses. That's, it, it's a, it's, you know, I call it the mythological industrial complex. I mean, it's that powerful. Mm -hmm. And as a founder, like, people have rewritten my story to make it seem as like, I mean, I have to really pound my head against trying to make it seem like you know, I ever got anything wrong. Because like, people start to make the story in the press, and it's just linear, straight, you know, good story structure stories are the ones people really like. So in a lot of cases, I've, I've been on the hunt for a company that really actually got it right from the beginning. And whenever you, like, if you can interview the people who are actually there, you, know, you will eventually discover, I mean, so far every time, that it's just it's basically not true. Um, my current, my, my, my favorite is Groupon, I mean, which I know is now, like, people are like, all debating is Groupon even a successful business or not, but whatever, certainly having a lot of growth. And they started out as this online petition platform mm -hmm. so that people could like lobby City Hall together and be like, we're all gonna have a protest and if you know, 100 people all agree to have the protest, then it will tip and we'll all go protest City Hall. That seemed like a great idea, right? So when they ran out of money, they were about to give up and they were like, well, let's try something different. And they had this idea, well, let's try like more of a coupon thing, just see what happens. Anyone know what the first Groupon was? Pizza. pizza, okay, people know the story. So right, two for one pizza in the pizza restaurant in the lobby of their building. I actually have eaten at the pizza restaurant, still, still there, it's like their local spot. And they built the coupon like, you know, on like a WordPress site, like no technology, no nothing. They were like physically emailing people PDFs of the coupon. Their like investors sent it out to all their portfolio companies and be like, everyone has to do this, like, you know. And, I, and they sold 20 pizzas, 20 two for one pizzas. And I know if you guys were there, if you could go back in time and you could be you in that pizza restaurant, you would have been like, oh, 20 free pizzas? Obviously, you guys are on path to be the fastest company in history to get a billion dollars in sales. I mean, what could be more obvious, right? Like, duh, of course. But some of us are not that smart. And what I think is really important about that story is to, to the outside, a lot of us, if that, was our, if that was actually your first idea to do social coupons and you got 20 pizzas, you could easily convince yourself that you failed. You'd be like, 20 pizzas, you know, who cares? Let's try something else. But because they had spent the previous year trying to get people to do anything at all and failing, I mean, they couldn't get none of their things ever tipped before. And I was like, oh, oh my God. We got 20 people in Chicago that slept through the snow to come to this pizza restaurant. That's actually, they understood what it meant. And that then gave them the confidence to keep going. So people talk about pivoting like it's a bad thing. Like, oh, it's just another word for failure. But it's actually a good thing. It means you've learned something. And you can make that failure productive. That's, that's the lesson of the story to me. Um, so how do you know who to work with <clears throat> when you create a company? I mean, you started off with your friends. And you all, I'm sure you brought a lot of uh, uh, you know, great skills to four. But um, you have coding. So that, that obviously makes you an invaluable member. Um, most of my journalism students don't have coding experience. So you know, how do you advise them on how to figure out who they can work with? How do you find people to work with? Not just coding, but anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how do you uh, also, uh, you know, let's talk about equity. I mean, what kinds of equity do you, you, do you offer? Or how do you deal with that equity issue? Or yeah. do you deal with it at all? Again, one of the reasons why people don't become entrepreneurs is just like, no one actually ever wants to deal with this kind of stuff. It's really unpleasant. Um, it's basically just as pleasant as dating. I mean, right? That's basically what you're doing is you're forming a long-term relationship with somebody and you're trying to evaluate, like, do we have the compatibility to make this work? Um, and so it has all the fun parts of dating or almost all the fun parts uh, and a lot of, like, and all the really unfun parts. And that's just, like, it's just a very human thing. When it's right, you generally know that it's right. When it's working, you know it's working. And when you're asking yourself if it's working, then you know that's already a good sign that it's not working. So it's like, it's, it's hard to explain. Like, my co-founders and I often were on the brink of killing each other. I mean, I, there were plenty of times when I went home, you know, went to sleep like really furiously mad, like, and had, you know, nightmares about like ripping my co-founders apart. I mean, really, like I was really angry. Um, but somehow we knew that we were all on the same side and that we were gonna get through it together. 
and well, what were some of the what were the you know causes of some of these conflicts? Oh, everything. I mean, it doesn't. It's just like in a relationship. Like it doesn't have to be important for it to become like the like kill each other over uh, conflict. Most of it had to do with like what, what's the direction of the company. I had a co-founder that liked that wanted to pivot every day. You know, like <laughs> basically, you know, he would just he was really he's just a brilliant visionary and. He was constantly coming up with a new direction we could go in, and he would send me these really long emails. Like he'd be up at three in the morning, and he would write me this essay, beautifully written, very persuasive essay about a new direction we should go in. And and I was just like, every time I got one of these emails, I wanted to die. It was just like a horrible experience. I was like, I can't. You know, I'm trying to execute to the thing we agreed on last week, and I can't keep changing it on me. You're you know, you're crazy, and. You know, I remember we. I remember having that. We had one of these arguments that finally got to the point. I was like, "Listen, you're giving me a new medical condition called inbox anxiety. I'm actually. I'm no longer checking my email because I'm terrified that every time I open up my inbox, there's going to be one of these missives in it. So you're like, I can't get any work done because I have like obviously email is pretty important for my job, and I can't. You know, like now in retrospect, what a dumb argument to have. Like really couldn't. Just like how stupid is that? But that's we were so inside it. We both wanted to make this thing succeed. And the, at the core of our disagreement was, he wanted to be the he wanted to have vision and really think expansively about what this thing could be. And I wanted us to think small and, and immediately and, and quantitatively about what do we have to do today to make it work. And the truth is, we needed to find a synthesis of those positions because both of those ways of thinking are critically important to a startup being successful. And in fact, I think a lot of times when I think about the good that I can do in the world with a lean startup. It is to simply broker that negotiation in so many startup teams, because we need to be able to celebrate vision and science, because actually vision is a prerequisite for science. If you have no hypothesis, you can't do science. If you don't have a really strong theory about how things are supposed to be, there's no science. And so the idea that somehow being scientific and quantitative is like mechanical and boring and formulaic, I just think is really deeply misleading. Uh, and so, you know, part of this is an educational exercise to get entrepreneurs to embrace vision and science at the same time. Because what neither my co-founder or I could ever do was articulate why we should work together. We were always, always just like, we should do it my way, and he's like, we should do it your way. And so, like, I would reflexively, what, I got to the point where whatever he proposed, I was opposed. Which he'd be like, we should do, and I'd be like, no, we shouldn't. He's like, I haven't even said it yet. I was like, I don't need to hear it. I know we shouldn't do it, right? Like if I open my inbox and I see your name, you're sending me a thing, like I know I'm already gonna be against it. And he felt the same way too. Like we just got into this like polarized situation where actually you don't make good decisions. Like that's not, that's not, that's not rational, that's actually crazy. Um, but we didn't have any framework for figuring out when should we trust our gut and go vision and when should we use a day. Like, and now I, now I think we can answer that question. Like I don't even think of that as a hard question. I mean, it's totally obvious. The point of all the data and science is to validate or invalidate the parts of the vision. So, like it's very it's like such a simple thing. I can say it. it you're gonna be like, oh, oh obviously, what? But like we were ready to kill each other about that. The reason we worked as co-founders is that we didn't actually kill each other. Okay, that's I mean that, honestly, that's it. We could have those fights and still keep at it. And if you look at the data, most startup founding teams fail because the co-founders can't can't keep it together. And you know that's just how it is. And you just want to find that out as soon as possible. And the nice thing with working with people you've worked with before is generally when people work together under any kind of pressure, you, you will find out if you're compatible or not. And you know, it's, it's the danger of being friends with your co-founders. Friends with, I mean, it's just you work with friends, you can easily blow up friendships over it. And the, dan the danger might be, though, if you're um, creating a business and you agree, OK, we're co-founders, 50 for you, 50 for me, split the equity, whatever equity we have to give out to raise funds yeah. or to bring other people will come out of both of our pools. Yeah. And all of a sudden, one of you, uh, say me, is a flake. Yeah. And I don't, I don't carry my own weight. And uh, you're doing all the work. And then, of course, you get really angry. And all of a sudden, we have this terrible conflict. And the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> you have to get rid of me. But you're stuck with me because I have the equity. And I don't have to give it back because we have a legally binding contract. Yeah, is this right? is bad. This is bad mojo. So it's bad. It's bad news, right? So, and it's very common. The flaky mm -hmm. co-founder who who disappears and then causes a lot of resentment and problems is very common. That is almost always the person who sues you later when you're successful, because they got screwed out of whatever. Like, like all of us who've been through this, when we watch we watch the movie The Social Network, and we're like, yeah, that's what happens. 
like, guys, that's just what happens. Deal with it. You know, it's like, it's not actually very dramatic because we've seen it a million times. It's very common. And everyone's right. This is not like, you know, the flaky co-founder is a bad guy who did something wrong. I mean, it's just, it's just what it is. So um, there's just, there's some basic legal things you can do to set this up right. And, and I won't, I'm not your resource for this. There's a mm. lot of, actually a lot of good material about this now. Like, all equity should vest. Mm -hmm. So equity vesting is really important. It should vest over as long a period of time as you can stomach so that if someone quits, they lose their equity or lose you know, a substantial portion of their equity. Um, and that, you know, that is not perfect. There are still situations. You know, you're, I've, I've seen people try to drive a co-founder out of the company through misery, just like making their life hell in order to get them to quit to get the equity. I mean, you, know, you create incentives, people will respond to them. But, um, there, there is kind of there are right things to do and wrong things to do, and there's a great book coming out called Founder Dilemmas uh, by a professor at, at HBS named Noam Wasserman, who actually has data on what are these different structures that people have adopted and what, just statistically speaking, are the outcomes that they get. It turns out that certain outcomes are like certain, basically certain choices you can make are just bad choices statistically speaking. They just put you in a bad, bad zone of probability. So just don't do it. Think a book of here are all the landmines you might step on. You can be like, well. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll skip that landmine. That sounds like a good idea. I guess at some point, somebody's got to pay for something. I mean, people can work, <laughs> some people can work free. I mean, not, not very, uh, you know, for people who don't have trust funds or who haven't already made lots of money, uh, it can be really difficult. And so what they want is a salary while they're creating this company. Meanwhile, those who invest in companies will tell you, we don't want to pay salaries. We want those young, hungry people who will code all night and live in crappy apartments and they have no life other than this business. That's what we want to invest in. So yeah. there's actually an ageism that goes on with startups. So you get to a certain age, no one wants to invest because you're too old. And I'm talking like in your 30s. You know, because, oh, you already have a family? Forget it. We're not going to invest in you. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it almost sounds like uh, that everything is kind of stacked toward the the uh, the the college sophomore or the freshly minted graduate who is willing to live on ramen noodles and and devote their lives to something when for most people uh, that's not something that's realistic for those who are married and have kids or who have a life you know and so you do run into these difficulties so I guess that's uh, I'm, I'm actually I guess creating a context but then and we can explore this but at some point you're going to need some money uh, to pay for, I don't know, office space or, uh, yeah, okay, maybe you can uh, work out of your homes. Well, that, of course, offers its own difficulties because then you're a virtual company. And you know what? There's a lot of difficulty being when you have a coder in Southeast Asia and you're trying to outsource stuff to Latin America, you know, and you run into all sorts of difficulties. So help me out here. What do you do? Well, the ageism is real and it's stupid. I mean, the data is actually super clear that uh, older entrepreneurs have better outcomes than younger entrepreneurs and like all kinds of other myths, like a lot of these beliefs that people have are myths. And like the myths don't, are not even mutually consistent. So they have this myth like we want people who like work, you know, all night, go crazy, you know, whatever. We also have this other myth that like, like super, there's, certain, there's people who are like super productive and other people who are not super productive. So there's like the 10x belief that like a programmer, you know, certain programmers are like 10x more productive than others. So it's like, okay, like, Someone who like works an extra four hours a day, like maybe assuming they had like assuming that the code that they write at two a.m. is just as good as the code they write at two p.m., which is speaking as an engineering manager, one hundred percent not true. Uh, that's still like only like fifty percent more like time invested. Like, but as someone who is like a, one of these ten Xers, that would be uh, you know a thousand percent more productive. So shouldn't we be looking for the ten Xers? And isn't it logically possible that the ten Xers like have kids because like they have some experience? I mean, is that you know? Anyway, these myths are really dumb and they're very pervasive. And every time you hear a VC talk about pattern recognition, just in your mind, you'd be like, oh, they mean bias. Right, got it. And like, yeah, human beings are biased. We make biased decisions. If you've read any of like behavioral economics books, or I like Danny Kahneman's book, the new one that just came out, it's awesome. And just when we make intuitive decisions, we don't, we're not rational, just as a fact. So all of these like, all this folk wisdom about what's true is not. And it's not like it's, 100% wrong, there's obviously some truth to it. If you look at the pre-scientific era of human civilization, it's like, it's not like we didn't accomplish anything as a civilization before, you know, in 1750, like agriculture and the wheel and fire, like human beings accumulated a ton of knowledge and we did all kinds of good stuff. But the problem with doing things on just strictly an intuitive basis is like all kinds of crap beliefs get, re you know, reified as knowledge that are not. And the same thing is happening in entrepreneurship. We're still in the folk wisdom phase 
where people have like passed down these sayings and aphorisms to each other, you know, and like there's some truth in them, but we could do way better. Why are uh, there so few women in startups and in entrepreneurial? I think I just answered the question. Is this the same question over again? Is it again? really, or oh, it makes other... me crazy. I think it's I think it's really stupid. I mean, look, I've got myself in more trouble trying to answer this question in public. There's no topic. <laughs> Of all the things I've said in Silicon Valley that people get pissed off about, um, that there should be more women, like that, 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 that we have, a, like not even that there should be more women, that we have a, a, merit, a meritocracy problem that is the cause of our diversity problem, which to me is the most obvious, like I didn't even think it would be controversial. It's just like, by the way, you know, just FYI, and people are like freaking out, and lots of famous people who we all admire have like, like I'm now persona non grata to them because this is like such an offensive concept to be writing about. Really? Oh, it's, I can't no believe, idea, I can't believe how angry people get about it. To me, it's like, it's the data, the science of how people make decisions uh, is like really clear. The, like the specific methods we use to decide who should get funding, who should get into like incubator programs. Um, have, like when those procedures have been studied in the lab, they reveal bias. And they reveal a very specific kind of bias that is people look for a candidate who are more like them and who are more like the candidates that they think have been successful in the past. So they just have a very, like they, they, you key on, as a human being, you key on irrelevant variables. And in, in the lab, when this has been studied, if you take away, like actually if you take away information, then you get better outcomes. So in my like hyper controversial essay on this topic, which you can read, I thought it was like very straightforward. I said, hey, given that was all this research, how about whenever we evaluate candidates with a written application, as they do in all the incubator programs, but also when we get resumes, when we do the evaluation, let's just black out the name, gender, and age of the person. So that we're just, we're just denying ourselves that information. Now, in, in that's, when that procedure has been studied in the lab, it, is much, it produces much more um, rational, meritocratic outcomes. And in fact, I, when I hire people, I never look, I do that exercise every time. And I interview, I, know, I can look at the before and after. I interview different people when I don't know their name, age, and gender. And I can't tell you the blowback for making that suggestion. I and mean, it's just people are really upset about it. So yeah, it's, a, it's an effed up culture uh, in this way. And we are in love with pattern recognition and, and we, want, we want to be basically, keep doing everything we're doing and call ourselves a meritocracy, which is not, it makes no sense. And if you look at, you know, programs like Y Combinator, I'm not trying to pick on Y Combinator in particular, but like they've published their data. I think they have 4% of their founders are women. And they're trying to get the best like CS grads, I mean, they're focused very much on programmers top, from top schools. And you say, well, what's the proportion of women in the graduating population of those schools who get computer science degrees is 30%. So even, mm -hmm. like, there's this like immediate gap from 30% down to 4% that has to be explained somehow. And they're like, well, people, those people don't apply to our program. So therefore, it's not our fault. It's like, does anyone see why that sounds crazy? I mean, to me, it seems really nuts. It's like if I, if I was trying to think about what program should I apply to, like the one that doesn't accept people like me, maybe he's not going to spend the one I'm going to spend the time writing my application for. That seems like a very rational decision that people would make. Anyway, now I'm getting myself in bigger and bigger trouble because I'm on video. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I'll, like I'll join you on that. But I mean, um, it also was like more than half the consuming population are women. And uh, you know, studies show that women control uh, you know the the spending habits of households. Yeah. Yeah. So you think that there would be more uh, you know women run startups because there would be a, a natural inclination to market to that population. When as I think of Silicon Valley, it's always like guy products. Yeah, by coincidence, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, look, like the people who like, you listen. I, I'll put it this way. The people, I, I've written these articles in public and the comment threads are open, but you can go read what people say, okay? So I'm, I'm just paraphrasing their response. Um, and it's often of the form, and, and I, this was Mike Arrington himself commented in response and he said, this is stupid, this is like a waste of time for us to be talking about this, Silicon Valley is the most meritocratic place in the world. And, by the, and, and like plus, when I see a woman or minority applicant, like I go out of my way to give them extra attention. And so like, there's no problem, what's the deal? And I was like, oh, Mike, that, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm a little bit surprised that you practice affirmative action. That doesn't actually seem like it's consonant with your meritocratic values. Um, <laughs> but I must be I'm missing something. And I was like, plus, if that, but if it's true that this is no big deal, then why, like, how about we just adopt this, like, why is it so hard to get this simple procedure of blacking out the name? Like, would you, would you do that? You're a VC now. Would you do that for your fund? And he's like, 
no, that's a waste of time. Like, I don't get a statistically significant, like, I don't get enough applicants of that kind to, for it to even matter. Like, go talk to some big company about it. And it's just like, I'm banging my head against the wall here. <laughs> you know, the whole argument that if you take those meritocratic steps, you might encourage people to apply who otherwise wouldn't, is like, I can't get anybody to take that idea seriously. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could have published my inbox the week after. I mean, the stuff people said to me was unreal. Okay, so you, uh, we talked about uh, learning, and you know, any writer has gone through this too. Like, I can't tell you how many book proposals I've written, uh, and I've sold, a, I think, a pretty healthy percentage of them, but I have a lot of proposals that I haven't sold. And uh, you know, you're always going to strike out, and I can honestly say that you know, there is a learning experience with it. Uh, it's a great learning experience, and I become pretty expert in a topic that I would have never pursued otherwise, because I thought I was going to sell it, though, but I didn't. Yeah. Um, but uh, you talked about learning as you go, and I know in, in Lean Startup you talk about some of the methodology you used, but that you know you, you need to be data centric and you need to look at what people are doing with your product and every step of the way. Now, can you kind of take a look at some of the uh, maybe some of the more well known companies and maybe how they they could have used data to to get to the point faster? Well, I I have the, a reason I'm in town this week is because I was speaking at this publishing conference, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty entertaining yeah, it <laughs> because is. trying to explain this concept to people in traditional publishing, I mean, in a lot of situations, I was in quite a few situations where I thought people were actually going to explode because <laughs> it's just like, you can't, you just, you can't do that. But like, like so let's just take that as an example because it happens to be very top of mind. Um, traditionally, all of us, like all these systems were set up so that people would basically beg for permission to do something. So you'd write a book proposal and you'd go beg a bunch of gatekeepers, please, 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 can I have it? And they would basically use their, 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 their amazing pattern recognition systems to figure out who is going to be good and not, and then they would divert the resources to people in proportion to you know, how good they thought they were from their you know, gut instinct. And I hope from our previous conversation, you can already see that's going to produce a like, horribly biased outcome. And lo and behold, it produces a horribly biased outcome. The kind of people who get the resources in publishing, you know, I mean, listen, it's people that look like me. So I do great. These systems work great for me. I've been very lucky to look the part. But like, why, like, why is that something I should be proud of or anybody should be proud of? Like, how ridiculous is that? Um, and objectively speaking, you don't get the best outcomes financially. So like tons of new products and new books and new movies that you spend millions and millions of dollars on are flops. And like, look, sometimes, you know, we, like we always joke in technology, sometimes you're working on teleportation or a cure for cancer or something that's too hard and just doesn't work. The technology doesn't work. But this, when we're talking about media, especially, we're not talking, no one's like, boy, can that book can be written? I wonder, is it, is it too hard? Is it too hard? It's just nobody wanted to read it. Like, that's not something that, it used to be, that is the kind of thing that used to be really hard to predict, right? Books took a long time to make. Like, literally took a long time to physically smear the ink on the pages and like distribute them to where, like, it used to be really, really hard. Now that's easy. And it used to be impossible to measure what happened with something like books. But now, it's easy. So I used to ask publishers, just to just torture them a little bit for fun, I would be like, so uh, what percentage of your readers actually finish the books you publish? And they'd be like, I don't know. How, how could you know such a thing? I was like, well, Amazon knows. Every, every person who reads a Kindle, they know for every person, for every book, what's the highest page they got to. Mm -hmm. So they could, if they wanted to, publish a list of what are the most read books on a percentage basis in the world. They don't publish that information for some reason. I wonder, I wonder why. They keep it secret. And publishers are like, what, what does that have to do with anything? I was like, well, I make a prediction. I predict that if we took a draft copy of a book, or heck, its first couple chapters, and we put it in the hands of 100 people, and we measured what percentage of them got to the end, I bet if we did that for every book when it was in the proposal stage, I bet you we could predict with high accuracy future bestsellers. Because if people won't read the book, it's not, going to be a super, it's not going to be a huge success. And the rate at which they read the book seems to be a highly relevant prediction. Now, maybe there's other metrics that would be even better than that. I don't know, but mm -hmm. we could start. The point is now we have the technology and the capability to test things small before they get big. And that, that means that massive launches for things that turn out to be a flop is a preventable condition. That should basically never happen. It should take at least as long for the thing to flop as it did for you to develop it. So like when someone works on something for five years and then it's in the market for six weeks, like most books are not even on the shelves for more than a few weeks. That's, that should never happen. 
when Microsoft, what was that phone they came out with before the Windows phone, the previous Rel? I can't remember. They bought some company. Mm -hmm. They worked on this thing in secret for five years. It was six weeks before they pulled it from the shelves. That should never happen. So that's, that's the promise here is we could, we could just prevent that kind of failure. I wonder about Flip Camera and Cisco buying it for shutting I think it down. $100 million dollars and then one year or two years later shutting it down and writing off $100 million dollars because with a Flip Camera you can't, you can't post it on, on a social network and it seemed pretty obvious to most people that for this device to work you're going to have to have some sort of uh, connectivity to it. And uh, it was just amazing to me that, that, that they were able to write out, well, I guess for them, it's $100 million, but it's like pizza money for you guys. But <laughs> still, it's $100 million, a and it's a pretty embarrassing, I think, uh, turn of events Super for them. Super embarrassing. And it's, it was completely unavoidable. I mean, it was completely avoidable. First of all, why did a company like Cisco, which <laughs> makes routers, place. buy Flip in the first place? But then, even when they did it, why didn't they then do something with it? But I guess, I guess what I'm leading to is the acquisition. You know, a lot of people, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs start out with like, I just want to make it and then sell it, which yeah. I would argue is a really bad idea. Just go work at Goldman Sachs. Seriously, uh, if you want to make money. Right. Yeah. There's a sure, like, there are sure fire path. You guys are already in New York, so just walk down the street <laughs> and there's ways to be guaranteed to make a lot of money in your life. Like, build a thing that maybe some big company will want to buy maybe someday. It's like, it's really not. Like, just do the math on the probability of that working out. Mm -hmm not recommended. But if, you're, if your goal is, I'm going to sell this to a bigger company, uh, you're probably not going to make it. Um, you know, acquisitions are pretty uh, difficult because even if you do have one of those companies that are bought, I don't know how many actually then succeed within the confines of the new structure. No. In fact, I mean, we, we usually celebrate exits. They call it an exit, right? When uh, that is a term that VCs made up because it means they get to take their money and exit it from the company with their returns. They're very excited. Um, and we usually celebrate exits, but uh, every time as an exit is almost always to me like a funeral because we know that the product is the next thing to exit. Right? We're not going to get to use it anymore. When Huffington Post was bought by AOL, like, it was a sad day. It's like, oh, that's too bad. That's going to mm -hmm. start going downhill. Think about it. it was a, how much, uh, I can't remember, $580 million, $60 million that AOL paid for Bebo. Bebo, $800 million for Bebo. And then I think they, they gave it away. Yeah, for like $25 million a year Three later. years later. Look at News Corp buying MySpace. Right. I mean, these stories dollars, go off, yeah. go on and on and on and on. And the reason why it's important to me that people other than just your garage entrepreneurs, actually people like you, understand what entrepreneurship actually is is because many of the players in the entrepreneurship ecosystem that dramatically impact the future of entrepreneurship are not the entrepreneurs themselves, but the people who, for one, in one way or another, hold them accountable. And like, if you look at, you know, we like to heap unlimited scorn on the idiots at AOL who spent $800 million on Bebo, right? Now, I don't know those people personally, but what can we say about them? What were their backgrounds, probably? They probably got an MBA somewhere. They were probably working corp dev at, I mean, like, this is like a business student a couple years later, you know, done some deals, and they made a really boneheaded decision. Well, that boneheaded decision is going to have lasting consequences for the entire entrepreneurship ecosystem because they just put $800 million into the pockets of a bunch of entrepreneurs and VCs who actually had accomplished almost nothing and made them famous and rich. Now, who is the next generation of entrepreneurial leaders who we all listen to? Why? It's the people who made the most money in the previous generation. Now, I actually happen to think the Bebo founders have been really good, have a really positive impact on entrepreneurship. But it's not because Bebo was such a great company. It's because we got lucky. But why are we putting the power to determine the future of the entrepreneurial ecosystem into the hands of these dudes who were MBAs a few years ago who don't know anything about entrepreneurship? That's, not, that's actually not a good choice ecosystem-wise. I'm thinking on the MBAs for a second, but like the, the next most powerful group of ignorant people are the journalists who write the stories about startups. So I, that's a huge problem. I, most of the board meetings I sit in, if I, like, I was a company, a very company that was a great company, I missed one meeting. Okay, I was traveling a lot, so I can't always be in the board meeting. I missed one meeting. The next month, what's happened? It's like clockwork every time I miss a meeting. There's a publicist hired, launch plan, like pre-briefings to media. I was like, what, wait, wait, what are we launching for? Like, oh, we, we got a great product. We're going to tell this great story. We're going to get famous. We're going to tell our parents about it. I was like, no, it's way premature. We don't know what we're talking. It's like far too early. But like, that is the validation that people crave. And they're like, look at this pitch we put together. We're going to dupe some journalists into writing this crap about us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I, you are. I know that you're going to be successful. I've seen this story a million times. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to be able to get that story written. 
So you'll feel good about yourself, but actually this is bad for everybody. It's bad because this, first of all, you're getting journalists to print lies intentionally. Uh, so like that's bad for you. It's bad for their credibility. It's bad for all the other entrepreneurs. Like all your competitors now can be like, uh oh, they're running away with the market because TechCrunch said whatever. We got to get into the, you know, we got to do a press release too. And like this stupid arms race blows up over, you know, who can have the coolest thing to show their parents. And just read the text of the article and be like, it, are any of these assertions backed up by facts? Is this actually true? Or is it just so and so says? It's not, it's just, it's just lies. I mean, like, let's just call it what it is. It is institutionalized lying. That's not good for anybody. And you talk about, I mean, there's almost this default mechanism with the way that PR works in, in journalism. I mean, at my inbox, I get flooded with pitches from publicists, and the vast majority of them are th for things I would never write about. Um, I mean, and, and pitching really dumb things, or uh, do I want to meet the founder of this company I never heard of? And my response is like, no. Uh, and anyway, it's not what I do anyway. It's 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 completely, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, it's just a waste of of uh, my time to even read them. I just scroll right through them and delete them and move on. But you you you, you do find that that uh, a lot of publicists uh, they're paid by placement and they're paid for their connections, and so they make money by successfully placing uh, their your their story, uh, you know, with a major publication. Th what they do is they they don't make guarantees, but this is how they function. And so the problem is that a lot of times I'll look at a company like, well, why do you care? Why do you need any press? You don't need any media coverage. Why don't you release a product? I'll tell you what, if you can rack up $100 million in sales, I'll write about you. If you can write about something that's going to change the world, I'll definitely think about writing about you. But if you're just, gonna, uh, if you're just wanting to get press because you feel like you need press, that's not a good reason to be written about. And I'm certainly not in the, in the uh, profession to help you sell things. So if you think that being in Fast Company magazine on the cover is going to sell you a lot of products, you know what? Maybe you'll get a bump up that month or two, but then it dies out. It's not worth it. What you really need to do is how about create a great company? You, write, you create a great company, you'll get a lot of press coverage. But before you do, I wouldn't even bother. I don't really understand why there's this need for that other than perhaps ego. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, there's uh, there are thousands of media outlets now, and yeah. um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's that it's that echo chamber as well, where sure. one thing is written about, and all of a sudden, twenty other uh, twenty other uh, publications will write the same story. Well, they might basically what they'll do is they'll take your story, and then they'll like basically copy and paste a few paragraphs out of it. They'll they'll write a little intro to it. They might stick in a couple snarky comments in the middle, maybe a little conclusion, and it take them 20 minutes to do after you spend a month or two. Or sometimes in my case, it could take six months to do a really good story, and then they're going to get the traffic. So it you know I had a, a discussion with an editor recently about a really great web editor, and he was saying like you know here's the battle I face every day when I wake up. I can basically put up crap. And make as much and make more money than by putting up quality. Quality costs money. Quality takes time. For the amount of money that I have to pay you to go off and research a story, and you know, with all the travel you might have to do, and then you know, all the additional research plus your your rate, which is you know maybe pretty high, and then we do the story. It may cost thousands and thousands of dollars for you to do a story. And you know what? I could have some kid put up a blog post and uh, mention cats or mention, uh, you know, uh, Miley Cyrus or something like that. And, <clears throat> you know, we're going to make more money on that. So what is the incentive for me other than my own uh, need to put out quality that drives this business? Mm -hmm. And I, he says, I try to strike a balance, but, you know, it's the temptation is great because if I'm, if I'm graded on my, uh, how much money I bring into this organization, then I'm better off just putting up crap. And then doing the echo chamber thing, linking and, uh, and uh, aggregating and curating and, and not really putting a lot of effort into original material because it doesn't really pay. So that's kind of where we are and well, it's difficult using, to change it. Because people are using the wrong metrics to evaluate success. It's like, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I'm struggling to find the right metaphor, but, you know, when you do that, you get, you're basically trading short-term results for the destruction of the long-term asset that you've built. So, I mean, we see this with people buying these media companies that have a great brand and, like, being paid a lot of money to systematically destroy them. We call it private equity. Like, that's, that's <laughs> like, it's just a, a, someone exploiting a loophole in the system that you can take this tremendous value and sell it off, like, by destroying it. And, like, because temporarily you produce, like, things that look like good numbers, like, you get rewarded. Um, when you guys are the decision makers, you're in a position to 
hold other people accountable, you can make it, you can choose to do something different. You can choose to use metrics that actually reflect the creation of real value for people. And you know, the, what we call the vanity metrics, right? The number of page views you get, the advertising impressions, the like raw numbers of dollars coming in. None of those are indicative of success because you could cheat. Like you could just start selling drugs on the side and like adding that money to your, you know, to your gross revenues and make those numbers go up. And like that actually is not an indication that you've done anything good. So we have to look, I mean, you know, and I obviously wrote a whole book about it, about trying to search for alternate metrics that really are more meaningful about the, you know, measuring the creation of value itself. Um, I want to open up for questions. So I'm sure some of you have questions. Is it so. possible to get some water? Is there anybody who could Yeah, make could that I? Uh, I'll try to figure it out. Thank you. Thank if you, you so go much. to the kitchen down the hall to the right, okay. the faculty lounge, we'll get it. Okay. Much appreciated. Thank you. I should have thought of that. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm just building on that last question and pertaining to journalism. Um, I'm starting a publication and I definitely see that there are things that you can do um, that produce like direct results. Like this, is, I guess, putting up crap can produce direct traffic. Um, and I also see that stuff that is very good, um, that is high quality, will actually ultimately produce larger results just in terms of hits, for example. But it takes a longer time. Um, so when starting a new company like that, how do you know when to persevere and when to if you're not really seeing the like you're not seeing direct traffic increases due to the quality it takes a while so how do you know what's how do you test yeah well because traffic's not a good indication of success mm -hmm. so because remember anything that you can cheat at is not a good metric and if you just want traffic <laughs> just put up top 10 cat photos every day <laughs> and you'll get you know or whatever the stuff they're putting on Huffington Post now I just you know, it's, it's absurd. Or, you know, like I mean, if you look at even all of the tech startup coverage, it's all vanity metrics, vanity metrics, vanity metrics. So it's like, sounds exciting. There's no follow up. But none of like, but TechCrunch wasn't built that way. And, and it couldn't be, you know, you want to start from scratch, you have to actually produce stuff that's of, that's of higher quality. So the challenge is to figure out what are the indicators that you, that what you think is quality actually is what your customers think is quality. So like, I would be much more interested if I was starting a new publication in what is the retention rate of readers week to week. Mm -hmm. If I had only 100 loyal readers last week, but this week I have 105 loyal readers, and it's the same 100 people plus five new ones, mm -hmm. I would view that as a successful week. Mm -hmm. And if it's I lost 20 readers, but I got 25, I don't know. I'm not sure. And if it's that I lost 95, but I gained 100, that's bad. Mm -hmm. That's actually not success. Because if somebody treats you, thinks that you provide quality content, they'll keep coming back. Now, your returns and then also how long they're staying. Well, how long they stay on the site, irrelevant. Yeah. I don't care. It's like, it's only a question of do they voluntarily come back? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe that suggests you want to make your money directly from those customers uh, as subscribers. Or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of possible business model ramifications. Mm -hmm. But even if you just want to make money on advertising and you eventually want to have zillions of page views, um, the only way to build enduring value uh, is to like build a loyal base of readers who will be your kind of core consumers of the kind of content that you kind of earn. And the nice thing about that is it's very easy to get become a pretentious artist about this and be like, well, I, anything, like because cat photos gets lots of hits, therefore anything that does not get a lot of hits is art. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. A lot of things that get no hits are, is also crap. It's just not popular crap. Mm -hmm. That's actually, that's even worse than cat videos from my point of view. That's, that's mm -hmm. just a complete waste of time. So sure. the key, like you can easily write like your 25 page manifesto each day and then nobody reads it and you're like, that's proof that I'm doing a good job. No. What we want to see is that indication that people are becoming increasingly loyal to your authentic brand and then, you know, you can have tremendous success very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have confidence that the work that you're doing is building, uh, like in this kind of business, this is basically, this is a business that should grow like a compounding interest table, right? So imagine that you have 5% word of mouth, you know, kind of natural word of mouth. People like your, your site and they tell their friends about it. Um, and if you actually combine 5% word of mouth with 100% retention, so once people start reading, they never stop. They just they keep coming back reliably. They're addicted to it. Then imagine it's 5% monthly word of mouth. Well, that's like having a bank account with 5% compounding interest monthly. You'd be rich really soon. So don't worry about that. 
you will sell page views to advertisers, but the page you will know where the page views come from. They will come from building a sustainable and enduring audience. And therefore, um, you know that you'll be able to use the advertising dollars to finance the creation of quality content in the end. If you have people's time and attention, you'll be able to sell it to advertisers. That's not a risk. Don't worry about that. Get their attention. Earn it. Which one you think of, and the most recent one that I heard sort of yesterday was um, like the Pinterest uh, example, where you know they, they were actually in the NYU business plan competition, and they were like a website where you like figure out what you want to buy and then bought it later. And they were like, well, no one's buying everything, but everyone's pinning stuff, so like we'll just do this pinning thing. And that's a great example of like they had to build. That's awesome because someone just pitched me Pinterest as an example of people who got it right from the beginning just no. the other day. No. Yeah, and I was like, I don't think that's true, but yeah, I was, I was like, I was now like, I know yeah. it's not true. To, to add to that, I know that. The guy who started, he, he pitched his business in Larry Linehan's class, and he was like, it's a pin board, and you can pin stuff, and everyone was looking at him like, what the hell is this? Right. What did Larry say? Larry was like, what the hell is this? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is curious. So, so you like, that's, a, that's a really yeah. interesting example of, like, you know, they ultimately had to end up building a lot of stuff to find, like, the one thing, right, that people were using. And uh, the challenge with that is, you know, it's really expensive to build a lot of stuff, right? You want to build, like, the least amount possible to learn the most. And so there's like definitely a tension there where I see a lot of case and points of like, you know, they build this whole big machine and, and they figure out that the one piece of the machine people were like engaging yeah. with. Um, and it doesn't feel like there's a really great way to always figure out what the one thing is. I mean, there's great ways to no. test like your hypothesis. Exactly. You, but, got, you got exactly right. Yeah. No, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying you'll be able to figure it out in advance. I'm saying just, just measure to make sure that you're right and then like put yourself in a position like they did to discover that, oh, that's the thing that's actually working. The only way you can find that out is by shipping a product and testing how people use it. And then the question is just like, well, well should you ship it you know, after one month of work, six months of work, or 12 months of work? And my point of view is there's no penalty for shipping too early, none. So since you have like, it's not like you ever, you know, we don't build products where they like all of a sudden all the parts come together and it's fully formed after 12 months. Like after one month, you have one twelfth of the product. Ship that. If people are like, this is the stupidest thing I ever saw, I hate it, I can't believe you didn't put XYZ in there, you'll be like, XYZ, you say? Why, yes, that is on our roadmap, good point. And more likely, if nobody says anything, then you can start to be like, hmm, yeah. I wonder. Just your thoughts on kind of incubators, accelerators, and you know, the good, the positive, and negative things that you think they provide for early stage companies? Well, we don't know. This is an open question. When, uh, when the bubble bursts and this all comes crashing down in the near future, uh, just like in the last bubble, many of these programs will have been revealed to be a waste. And a lot of them, you know, most of them, uh, most of them basically measure their success by you know, the paper valuations of the companies that have graduated. But in a rising tide, everyone's raising money, everyone's getting valuations. A lot of these programs, I'm not gonna say which in particular, but a lot of them are basically teaching you how to pitch to VCs so that you get funded, so that then they can add you to that list of funded companies. I mean, that's, and if you are from the outside, if you're not in a startup ecosystem and don't have access to VCs and don't know how to pitch, that's actually super helpful. So uh, I think they've actually done a lot of good for the world. Um, in particular, I think they have brought people into the entrepreneurial ecosystem who wouldn't have become entrepreneurs either who wouldn't otherwise have become entrepreneurs, you know, by making it prestigious, giving it a brand, like really giving you a place to go. Um, I think they've helped outsiders get funding who wouldn't have been able to otherwise, especially in the early days, although now, like I said, they're becoming very homogeneous. Um, and I think that the men in some of the programs, the mentorship and connections you get are really quite impressive. Um, and in a lot of the programs, it's just, they're just glorified admissions officers. They're just taking people, you know, the best people they can find and then riding those people's success. Nobody, as far as I can tell, has done any kind of systematic study of whether, the, whether these incubators actually create or destroy value. So, you know, we don't know. But uh, my guess is that the top ones will be, will be enduringly successful, if for no other reason than it's a self-fulfilling prophecy now and the best people want to go apply there. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really have a strong opinion about whether you should do it or not do it. It kind of depends on your, your unique circumstance. Are we in a bubble? I mean, I think it's really obvious, but you know, we'll see. Uh, well, I mean, that's actually a good. I mean, I, that's a debate I, you know, uh, follow online a lot. Yeah, you know, two camps at least. But 
uh, you know, there are some who are saying, no, it's not a bubble at all. Why? No. Because everyone remembers the last bubble. And I think that's kind of a specious argument. But My favorite was, I can't remember who it was. It was, I shouldn't name names anyway. You can find this so quote <laughs> somewhere. There was something like, or like, I don't think it's a bubble. And they were, they're an investor. And they said, so, okay, okay, that's right. Like, if it was a bubble, like, if I, you know, I wouldn't have anything to gain by saying it's not a bubble. Like, you know, if it was a bubble, I would call it like it is. I was like, you don't have anything to gain? Like, by making people think it's not a bubble, like, people give you money. Like, tons of it. And your company's valuations are increased. Like, you have every incentive in the world to make it, like, try to oppose the idea that it's a bubble and make as much money as you can while the getting is good. So, you know, it's like anyone who has a financial stake in getting you to believe something is just like, why don't we just find a different spokesperson for that cause? <laughs> you know, maybe they're right, but like, surely somebody who's a little bit more neutral is available. Um, and so I look at it, what's happening now, and you know, the economy is bouncing back really slowly, but obviously the, the growth in valuations and the amount of money being thrown at startups has, it's been a few years of this. And even at the worst parts of the economy, this was happening, and I just, well, what causes it? Is this like this, Almost like um, I, I don't want to denigrate it because maybe maybe it's a really good thing. I don't know. But well, a lot of innovation uh, gets financed this way. I certainly, you know. And listen, I'm a beneficiary of this. Everybody in the business. The reason why these like we all do this mutual cheerleading is like everyone's got money to make. Mm -hmm. We all make we all make a lot of money from this. Uh, a, like if you just look at the people who are talking about entrepreneurship, you just be like, where does that person's money come from? Let's just follow the money. You'll be like, oh. Like, they made a lot of money in the last bubble, and they're making a ton of money in this bubble. How about that? We There's, put the bubble people on TV during bubbles. Like, that's the number one indicator that we're in a bubble. It's people who made money in the last bubble are, like, the most famous entrepreneurs at the moment. So there's you know, like, obviously a huge push around, you know, jobs in this country and where they come from. And then you see a lot of it, the talks around entrepreneurship, which start yeah. in America. And it's really hard not to be really excited about that. And you're like, yes, everyone should be an entrepreneur. But at the same end, you know, you talk about one out of ten maybe entrepreneurs is successful and a lot of wasted human capital is wasted on like running down ideas that are stupid and you're trying to prevent people from doing that. So the question is like, is that really a valid place to push so many people? Or is that not necessarily as good of an idea when you dig under the surface as it sounds in theory? I mean I, I get excited about it myself and then I'm a big supporter of South America, but at the same time the really odds speak for themselves. First of all, we have structural unemployment. You know, real, I mean, real unemployment problems in this, in this country. We are reliving the 1920s, okay? Like, you know, incredibly powerful people making astronomical amounts of money and, and crisis level numbers of people out of work. Mm -hmm. And the idea that somehow the economic lessons of the 30s like are no longer valid now for some odd reason, that's like, I'm still waiting for anyone to explain to me, makes no sense. So like, I don't understand why Keynesian economics is like discredited all of a sudden when in fact it seems the math of it, I don't like. I'm not. I mean, this is an ideological point, but just the math of it seems pretty straightforward. That we have a lack of aggregate demand, and that like that's a huge part of our employment problem. And like, let's, I, and people who are like, it's all about job creators and entrepreneurs solving this problem. It's like, but no. like, there's also public policy things you have to get right that are important, and we're not going to job creator our way, uh, you know, out of a lack of aggregate demand. Last time I checked. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it's what I think. Seventy percent of the economy is consumption driven. So why aren't we trying to give people who spend money, which is basically all of us, more money to spend or make our lives easier? That will boost the economy. Um, anyway, I never. Hey, anyway, like, yeah. I don't want to get in politics. Yeah, but I mean, exactly. Like, <laughs> we may get in trouble. We have, uh, but no, no, we have to separate out those two things because they're both really important. If that's all we do, if all we do is try to stimulus our way out of this problem, we're also going to have a problem. So everyone talks about the crisis in manufactured, in manufacturing in America, right? A very common trope all over. You never hear anybody talk about the crisis in the availability of manufactured goods, right? It's not like people are like, I, can't, I need man some manufactured thing I can't find any. There's a shortage. Like we, we got surplus of everything. Um, it's manufacturing employment that's gone off a cliff. If you look at the actual like output of America's factories, we manufacture more stuff in America than at any time in our history. We're actually really good at it. The problem is we don't need that many people to do that anymore. And that's a real structural change in our economy, that all routine work is going to be automated. It's going to be done by computers and robots. And that's, in the short term, a huge problem, because you've got all these people who have been trained for skills that are, are becoming obsolete. But in the long term, it's a huge opportunity. It's actually awesome. It means that no one's ever going to have to do routine drudgery type work ever again. Any work that can be done in an automated way is going to be done in an automated way and should be done in an automated way. It's like, Human beings are not for routine work. I don't, I don't believe in that. 
that means we have all of these people's creativity available. Like right now we see them as an unemployment crisis, but I see it as an imagination opportunity because you have all this creativity in all these people who are now freed from the drudgery of that work. But that is gonna require massive public policy changes to harness. It's not good enough to just be like, everyone's on their own and like become an entrepreneur and good luck. Because we have to, we have to basically renegotiate the social contract in this country. We have to say the old social contract that we have been busy hacking away at, that our grandparents negotiated, uh, like we've been willfully hacking at the foundations, I think, stupidly. So uh, we shame on us for doing that. But also, the world is substantially different from 1935. I mean, really, in very deep structural ways. Like, you know, in 1950, it's just as a different world. The idea that you have lifelong employment in a relatively boring job for a relatively boring company, like, that's not what it's going to be. So the new social contract's got to be about encouraging risk taking and providing a strong safety net for those who take the risks so that they have something to fall back on if it doesn't work out. So that everyone is free to use their creativity, can in, you know, invest in education and infrastructure to do the kind of experimentation that we're talking about and really like train up an entrepreneurial workforce. I think that's gonna be awesome when we finally get our heads out of our collective, you know what, and start doing it. But it's not gonna happen on its own. I don't think this is something you just wait and see and hope for the best. I think like, we know exactly what happens when you do that. It was pretty ugly the last time. No, it's the long run, and as John Maynard Keynes said, in the long, long run, run, we're all we're dead. Why is the company stop being categorized under a startup? Um, and I'm basing this upon you know, the definition you gave us in the startup machine, if you look. Um, because you've mentioned that you know, these, these are companies which are established during time of great uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? And so do you base this on the measurable like maybe revenue stream or maybe in a tech startup, something like user numbers and stuff? Because I'm actually also going to tie in with an example from South Africa. I'm from South Africa. And um, Forbes Africa recently released a top 20 startups in Africa list. And um, this company called Motribe, who are kind of like linked, but it's named exclusively for mobile. Um, they made number nine on the list. And you know they use the numbers of growing at an average of about ten thousand per day, uh -huh. um, right? And I mean, in the first six months that they were established, I they grew within like from August to about like March thereabouts when they were at South Southwest to about eight hundred thousand users. So anyway, they're in, in that list, and to me, it seems like you know their situation is more certain than uncertain. Mm -hmm. So are they still supposed to be labeled a startup or just? Maybe I'm seeing the word startup in a yeah. no, connotation. Sure, okay. sure, sure. It's actually a spectrum. There's not, there's not such a thing as a startup, and there's not such a thing as a established co an established company. Like, they're actually, it, it, like, those, like, we want as human beings to put these things in very clear categories, but I really think this is a spectrum. And um, what we want is to be able to use the tools of general management. That's, that's actually like, like we talk about the planning fallacy. There are people in this world who make plans and execute them on a routine basis. Like there really are, and they are people who are like the best general managers in the world. The people that handled the supply chains that like made everything in this room, like these computers, the clothing I'm wearing, everything we ate today. Like there are people who do that well. It's when you have enough of a stable operating history to start being able to make forecasts. Now you can start to hire and run general management, you know, projects. The problem is that. Um, if all you do is graduate from being a startup, to, you know, from entrepreneurial management into general management, uh, in the old world that would have worked fine because once you kind of figure out, okay, now I got the General Motors, I can just execute this General Motors plan for the next five decades and be market leader. Like now, the amount of time you get to do that is like five minutes. So you have to then, uh, even if you have a very successful business, you know, like a Facebook or a Google, you have to immediately start to like move yourself back into the spectrum of entrepreneurial management because the world is changing too quickly. So every company, if you, as soon as you have three customers, you already have this problem of having this portfolio of different things you could do. How, do I, how much should I focus on my current customers versus trying to find new customers? I, that's a perennial problem you have as soon as you have one customer. So I think the right way to think of it is not like, it's not about startup versus not startup, it's about what's my portfolio, what's my allocation, just like in, in finance. You know, when you're just in a garage and you have no customers, like your portfolio, you're all in on just this high risk, you know, growth stock. That's it. That's like, but really, like, you don't have to worry about portfolio management. It's like when you're poor, you don't have to worry about your portfolio. Like, portfolio management is a rich person's problem. And the same is true in companies. Like, only companies that have success now have the problem of having to decide how much of my work should be allocated towards disruptive innovation and how much towards sustaining innovation. 
And as long as neither of those numbers is zero, probably doing fine. What's the, what, what do you think is like the best executing company in terms of being lean and adapting quickly given you know, the increase in the answer and kind of volatility of your fish? It's a good question, and I wish I had a good answer. It's so hard to know because it's hard to get the truth about any of these companies. You read these puff piece profiles. That's where most of our information comes from. The only company that I've, I've gone behind the firewall in a few companies, and one that particularly impressed me was Amazon. I really like the way that they're run internally, from what I can tell as an outsider having visited. Um, they are very good at building internal startup teams and giving them a mandate to get, get stuff done, and I think the results speak for themselves. But. Starting, starting to start companies right out of college, um, do you feel any regret in that that you went right into it, and is there a right time to start thinking about starting a company on your own? Um, do you feel like... Yeah, strictly you hypothetical would... question. I love these. Strictly hypothetical. When you have lots of money, then you can afford to start your own company. No, I'm kidding. Well, not, not necessarily afford, but maybe have enough life experience to know what, what you're getting, to, or to just dive in. Just do it. I mean, I, I took a semester off to do my first company, and then it failed in time for me to go back and get my degree. And I'm actually lucky. That actually was good for me. I'm glad I did. I think, I think the education I got as an undergraduate was really valuable. Um, but uh, you know, people are always like, well, I, I actually was at Harvard, and someone was like, you know, is it, is it a good idea to like, start a company with my roommates? And I was like, you know, I was like, listen, in general, statistically speaking, no. If your roommate is Mark Zuckerberg, Answer yes. <laughs> so like, I can't answer your question in general. If you have something you believe in. <laughs> as far as <laughs> that I'm concerned with um, direct focusing heavily on, on just entrepreneurship and business, and maybe wondering if maybe from your perspective you feel like you maybe wanted to explore a little more before you dove into it. Generally counsel people to finish their degree. Um, and like, there's one guy who you know, I was meeting with and he dropped out of top school after like, I think he was there for one month as a freshman and already dropped out to start doing startup stuff. And I was like, this is bad. This is a bad plan, man. I really don't think you should do this. And I felt bad. I don't want to be that like disapproving old guy who's like, make sure you follow the approved path because I'm supposed to be Mr. Entrepreneur. But I actually think, um, I, I think I got a lot out of, out of being educated. And I feel like when I, when I hire people who have a liberal arts degree and really like have, have thought deeply about anything in their life, like. I think that's a huge asset business-wise. So I, I wouldn't be in a rush to drop out and do it. But on the other hand, I wouldn't be afraid of dabbling with stuff on the side.